Hey everybody. So before I dive directly into the model, I want to explain uh, exactly why I like this particular parameter range. If you have watched any of my other videos, you'll see a pattern I've probably reviewed and played around with uh, every single 1 billion to 1.5 billion parameter model that currently exists, uh, which is why I've now built my own, because I want to improve upon what I've uh, researched in this area. But so uh, there's two reasons. One of them is the practical reason, and I mention it in almost every video, which is that I use the free version of Google Colab. So I have uh, like personally multiple hardware units. Like I have an Elite Book, a, a Pro Book, uh, a uh, tricked out desktop with a Xeon processor, etc. But all of them have the same issue, which is that they all run a <laughs> Radeon GPU. So essentially, every single piece of hardware that I personally own is like worthless when it comes to um, coding out and testing AI. So I utilize Google Colab a lot and then I utilize the free version because um, I don't want to invest heavily into hardware. And then, so that's the practical reason. But the secondary reason and like the, the research reason is uh what we're looking at here and then so this is a famous paper now it's come out and then it's essentially that what we can see is that with emergent properties they come at around 775 million parameters it's not an exact number it's not like just get it to 775 and that's all you need to do uh, but we know it's right around that range like somewhere in there whatever happens within you give it this amount of parameters and then you start seeing emergent properties uh, what exactly are emergent properties? Your guess is as good as mine. Um, like I can speculate, but that would be it. But the only thing that we know that is true about that equation is that right around this number is uh, where, where they start happening. So to me, 1 billion to 1.5 billion parameters right within that range, it's a very safe number for when we can start start seeing emergent properties. And then so to me, like if I'm investigating that and, and trying to understand more about that particular question, I don't want to look at 180 billion parameter models. Like I don't want to look at even 7 billion parameter models and 30 billion parameter models. I want to look at the ones that are like right there at that cutoff. Like what does, what's, what's a um, 1 billion parameter model compared to like a 1 million parameter model or a 30 million parameter model? Like ones that I know are well under that threshold compared to ones that are right at that threshold and then so to me that brings like fundamental questions and then when i play around with these models what i've noticed with models within this range is that um this one billion parameter range they they lack what i would call generalization abilities that i can see in other models like in uh even with seven billion parameter models and then i can see when I play around with different models, I can see the varying degrees of what I would call like generalizability. If you ask uh, like GPT-4 or BARD uh, like a off question and then you word it off and you're, you're not quite clear with your thoughts, there's still the model is still going to be able to generalize enough to be able to make sense of that. Uh, whereas with a 1 billion parameter model, if you give it something that is like not directly from its training sets it's not going to be able to answer and then so my i want to explore that further and i want to uh explore that to the limits and then see like is that actually true like it, it, is it impossible for a one billion parameter model to to generalize and then so with that in mind essentially i decided to build out an architecture from the ground up that gives the model like a chain of thought reasoning and like designing that specifically into the architecture. Um, and then so my logic for how does it design that specifically um, into the architecture is uh, to essentially give the model individualized attention mechanisms so that it can like um, not just uh, pay attention to the next token in the sequence, but that it can also pay attention to words before, etc. So expanding the range there. Uh, and then also essentially giving it what's uh, called here a gated fusion mechanism, which allows it to uh, <clears throat> take in like different inputs and then uh, utilize those inputs in a sequential order in order to like generate an output so if it's a like um math problem solving where it's uh 
like John has two apples and Jamie has three apples uh, and Joe has four apples, how many apples are there? And then so this model with this particular architecture will be able to take each one of those per, like Joe, John, and Jill in, in, in sequential order um, and like um, combine them uh, in the fusion mechanism in order to produce the output from that. And then so my thinking with this architecture is is that if it's also trained on like a massive data set of chain of thought reasoning type of data and along with that then this would be like the ultimate model that I could build within the 1 billion parameter range to see if it's able to generalize and then if it's not able to generalize like on a, gen on a particular level after that then the question is solved like uh, one like around 1 billion parameters generalizability is not a uh, emergent property that we can expect on that level so if you expect generalizability you'll want to go above 1 billion parameters or it could answer the question the other way but to me like it's an important question to ask and we don't know the answer to that question yet and so at the point where we don't know answers to these questions it poses interesting research questions to me at the very least so will this model have practicality at the end of the day i don't know it, like it'll be just as practical or more practical i would imagine than the phi 1.5 model if it was trained on the same types of data that the phi 1.5 model was built on i would argue that my architecture is better i don't know i don't know the specific architecture of the phi 1.5 model but i know that my model here takes into consideration uh, architecture um, differences and, and choices that aren't in other models that I've seen. So I can't imagine that, uh, it, again, I don't know, because it like I would have to train out the model. But so going through the code here specifically, and then what we're looking at, it's very simple. So it's just, uh, I'm importing Torch, and then from Torch, I'm importing the Torch.nn libraries, which is like the Torch.neural network libraries. And then so just explaining this out, this the torch.nn libraries make it really simple to uh, build your own model because it, it does a lot of the work in here so everywhere where you see like the dot nns uh, for the layer norms the dropouts the linear like all of these everywhere where you're seeing these i the library is taking care of uh, like the back-end code that needs to be done for there so that's why this code is so light and uh, what you're looking at here if I didn't have the the, the neural network libraries in here if they were doing this work this code would be huge it would be like a lot longer but uh, just taking advantage of the libraries that are in Python and all of the resources that are there like again it, it's really easy um, to build this out and then to build a play around with these different parameters add all of the different things that i want here like building out these models at this point isn't the hard part at all um the hard part is in the training uh and then so i've included that here in the code as well if you want to train the model uh you just save it um and then here's really simple uh loading just uh, essentially load the model uh and then uh fine tune it out um and that's really all you do <laughs> in order to uh, get this model up and running. Uh, I say that's all you do. And so the reason why I'm not fine tuning it is because that's the expensive part too, right? Like you have to like, uh, so Microsoft Five, for example, I think it was trained on 1 billion tokens. Um, and then I think they trained it for eight days. So uh, 1 billion tokens over eight days, uh, it probably cost like $1,000 to, to fine tune this. I like, and that's, I don't know. I just, I don't want to invest like, I just don't feel like, um, you know, like dumping a thousand dollars into uh, researching out. I like, I'd rather just like explore in other areas. Like I like building out and having fun with these models, but I hope that someone takes this model. So uh, for me, I'm releasing, uh, if anyone wants to utilize this model, wants to utilize the code, doing anything with it, yeah, I release this fully uh, open source. Like, uh, any, like anyone can do anything with the code. I don't care. Uh, uh, like I would hope that you would uh, just give me credit, but like I, I like I don't care. So it's full open. Do whatever you want with this code. I don't own the code at this point. Um, but uh, I will hopefully make more videos on this uh, model. Uh, I will play around with it more. I might 
I do want to invest some time into like the fine tuning process and then uh, doing more there. So I might in the future make more videos. I'm not going to spend a thousand dollars on the fine tuning process, um, but I'll figure it out. I don't want to skimp on the fine tuning process because I think that like to me that's a, another important element and aspect of this. I see that like um, a, a lot of models that I train on or I test, I notice like I always just wish that they were trained on more data. Uh, you can see it in the model itself. So I don't want to produce another model that is like that, where it's like, oh man, this would be the best if it had more data. I'd rather just give it the more data up front and train it right from the beginning. Um, but so uh, if you like this content, please like and subscribe. And please, like, if you want, fine tune this model and do whatever you want with it. Thanks very much.